This bites. Your commercial's stupid, you're a no-talent hack, and your donuts are stale. I'm out of here. Fast, fast, fast. Oh. Oh. So over the past few weeks, we've seen some stalwart creators at DC Comics kind of coming out and giving some insight. You know, kind of what, what's going on at DC is they're kind of going through a transition period. We've heard from Jason Fabok. You know, we know Jeff, Jeff Johns, um, Greg Capullo, Scott Snyder, Tony Daniel, <laughs> Francis Manu Paul. Sounds like Jack. A lot of, of mainstay creators over at DC Comics have been taking work elsewhere. Uh, there was recently an AMA on Reddit with Cy Spurrier. He was the, the creator of the, the recent uh, John Constantine series on, I think it was the, the Sandman imprint on DC Black Label. I think he had another series and, and it got canceled. Wasn't too happy. He was basically being pretty honest about it. And I just, I wanted to talk to somebody that was has worked inside the industry, give a little bit of insight into this and maybe some of the frustrations that uh, Cy Spurrier has been uh, going through and just kind of, you know, talk about some of what, what he had to say here. We'll, we'll talk initially about the stuff that kind of gives us an idea of what's happening at DC Comics. And then the other things I think are just more generally what, what creators kind of go through during the creative process on pitching and stuff and some of the frustrations they go through. Obviously here with me to talk about this is the High Sparrow himself, the man that will shame everybody on the interwebs, Aaron Sparrow. How you doing? I'm doing great, Wes. How are you? I'm doing excellent. So obviously Cy Spurrier, he's been in the comic book industry a long time. He's got a big series coming up within the Reign of X line. He's got that Way of X uh, Nightcrawler series. So it's not like he doesn't have work. I believe he said he also has five other projects that he's working on at the moment. So it's not like DC dropped him on his butt, but he is not too happy about it. But this is kind of what he had to talk about DC and their editorial and the, the turnover. Honestly, no idea who has who to harass for such things these days i.e. on how to pitch an idea. There have been such er huge earthquakes within the DCU, DCU editorial community. So many excellent people have lost their jobs, and I haven't yet had the chance to figure out who's where. I tried on several occasions to contact editors with not much luck. The charitable view, charitable view is that everyone over there was so busy and stressed, I slipped through the gaps. Their paranoid view is that I pissed somebody off uh, somewhere on the line. Uh, who knows? Do you find it surprising that, you know, someone that's worked with DC, you know, in the past or recently doesn't have a contact or, or can't get in contact or, with anyone to know what's kind of going on? Well, this is the eternal frustration of being in the comic book industry and why when you're on a panel and someone will ask you, you know, oh, how do you break into the comic book industry? You know, I, I always tell them that there's, you're, you're always kind of breaking in. I mean, until you hit that level of editors seeking you out and coming and you know coming to you for work and asking you if you have a pitch or, or picking you you know out of uh, out of a hat and saying like oh this guy's good you know let's let's uh, let's work with him you're always trying to form relationships with the editors at these companies and sometimes you'll invest a lot of time with a specific editor you know you'll be pitching to them and they'll be receptive and then all of a sudden they'll be gone they'll quit or they'll get fired and you have to start over at you know, step one, you have to find, you know, you have to either talk to the new editor or you have to go pitch to another editor. So you have to have these relationships constantly and it's not easy. And it's particularly not easy in the current uh, situation that we find the industry in where people are losing their jobs left and right. There's downsizing, you know, these big companies have bought out, uh, you know, the, the parent companies and then are just, you know, it's just an IP farm, but they don't really have any interest in producing the comics. They don't have any real interest in, you know, creating the mythos or relationship with these creators. So to them, it's just like, hey, cut costs, get somebody cheaper. So, you know, it could be Cy Spurrier. He might, I mean, I don't think he's in the upper echelon of, uh, of DC creators that are, you know, making like top dollar. Um, I'm sure he's probably somewhere, uh, you know, just use a wrestling term on the mid card. But, you know, that may be too expensive for DC at this point, and they just may not, you know, see the numbers coming in and feel like it justifies uh, keeping him on staff. Obviously, yeah, he was expressing some frustrations that he wasn't included with this new DC initiative with Infinite Frontier. Obviously, they brought in a lot of new talent that really don't have a lot of credits to their name as far as comic book writing. You know, a lot of uh, screenwriters, some, some people knew the industry. It probably is that his pay rate was just a little too high as they're trying to cut costs. We know they essentially gut it out. They don't really have exclusive creators anymore. Yeah, and you know we've all had the rug 
pulled out from under us as, as creators. It's, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. If your series isn't making the company enough profit or, you know, for whatever reason, either because it's just not catching on, uh, you're not, you know, you're, you're, just, you're not connecting to readers, uh, you're working on a character that isn't dynamic enough or, or you know, well known enough to to kind of like grab people. I feel like Constantine is is very well known in the, in comic circles, and yeah, you know, there's been a movie and there's a TV show and things like that. But we, we, as we know, the movies and TV shows don't translate to people seeking out the comics. So when you do a book that's part of a Sandman subdivision of DC's line during a time when the entire industry sales are depressed that book is probably not going to make it past 12 issues. Most books don't now. They, they pretty much cut their losses. And, you know, we can talk about why that is. A lot of it is bad marketing. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, you know, just kind of creators chasing away. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not talking about Cy Spurrier in, in specifically because I don't know anything that he's, he's, you know, any behavior that he's done online or had online that uh, would push readers away. But, you know, his colleagues have definitely pushed readers away. There's less people buying comics. Uh, they've decided that, you know, they're going to go spend their money elsewhere. You know, their entertainment dollar is going to go to an industry that doesn't insult and, and seem to uh, despise them. So, you know, you've got all of those factors, you know, the, the typical incompetence of uh, companies to get the word out there about your series, uh, to continue to get the word out there once, the, once we're past the first issue, and just, the, you know, the general kind of migration that we see from fans away from comics. Uh, it's it's a bad time to be starting a book, especially a niche book. So he did kind of go into what you were discussing there, talking about his John Constantine series. Essentially, I think it got cut at five or six issues. It was definitely early. I think maybe he had just finished the first story arc. And this is what he had to say about this. A lot of frustration here. My stupid, colossal, effing mistake was to assume I was still living in the 90s when comics got at least a couple dozen issues to flex their muscles and find their fullest audience before anyone quibbled about probability. Honestly, like, I don't, yeah, that's, people are losing their job, man. <laughs> like, and it's not just in the comic book industry. People are losing their jobs all over the place. It's all about profitability. And, you know, you're probably not going to get that, you know, that 18 issue grace period to try and, and, and gain an audience. You probably get three or four issues. We've seen comic books get canceled before an issue has been printed. Yeah, I think uh, what was Scarlet Strike Force uh, was canceled before the first issue hit the stands. Uh, it's just it's a matter of what these companies can afford to, you know, to put into it. And he's he's absolutely right when he says like you know thinking that it was the '90s and that he was going to have, you know, some issues to play with. You don't have that luxury anymore. You you can't go into anything. I, this is this is actually a really important lesson for comic creators to learn. I think because. I don't think they've learned it yet, and we're well past the time that it, that it should have been absorbed. We're not necessary. There is not a single one of us that is necessary to these companies. These companies don't care about you. They don't have a relationship with you. You are a tool to produce not art, but you're producing a consumer product. You know, so uh, all these people who are saying like, oh, you know, I, anybody who refers to fans as, as customers, like I can't, you know, I can't wrap my head around that. You need to. You need to because that's what they are. You are not producing art. You are producing a product. That product needs to be purchased in order for you to continue to produce it. So I think this is a, a harsh lesson. I think people kind of need to, to, to look at what Sai is saying and, and really absorb it in, in maybe even a different way than he's presenting it, which is you've spit on the customer for so long, and now we're in a depressed period where people don't have the money to go spend $5 on a comic book. This is what happens. And we're all unnecessary and we're all going to be on the, on the unemployment line. And there's always somebody who can come in cheaper if they do feel that they need to produce a book. And that's what we're seeing with DC right now. People are, you know, they're getting people with not a lot of experience because to the parent company, it doesn't matter. It's just producing a thing to put out. They, I, I think that the leadership at DC doesn't even really care about the quality of the books anymore. It's just a, it's just a widget to be sold. And if it's not selling, we'll cancel it and we'll get somebody else because obviously you didn't do a good enough job, even if it's the, even if it's their fault, even if it's their fault with the marketing. And and, you know, it, that's not the way that they're going to view it because they don't care about you as a creator. You're you're just a tool to deliver a product to the customer. Yeah, we've seen for for Marvel Comics for a long time, and I think it's definitely affected the way that we've seen people write is you have to be writing your series like six issues at a time. You, you don't really get, do. 
you don't get 50 issues to tell your full story. You need to get to it, you know, and keep people engaged and coming back for more. Otherwise, you know, you might be on the chopping block and it obviously it's going to be kind of transitioning over to, to DC comics. Do you like, do you think a, a creator like a Chris Claremont would even be able to survive in a, in a environment like this? I mean, clearly not. And you know, Chris Claremont, he, he barely gets any work anymore. He'll get like a little, a little one shot here and there. They're not giving him a series with which to kind of like spin his, you know, long form storytelling. And it's really sad. I, I, I'm somebody who loves long form storytelling. I love planting those seeds and, and, you know, revealing them over time. And, and, uh, and so I sympathize with Cy because, you know, I, I definitely, you know, when we started on Darkwing Duck, we were told like, okay, well, you know, come up with like three years worth of stories. And so we were like, oh, okay, we're going to, we're going to run for, for three years. And what we couldn't count on, or, you know, what we couldn't have predicted was the fact that once the first issue came out, we weren't going to get marketed. We weren't going to be allowed to do interviews because the interviews, the questions had to come in and be submitted to Disney. And then once they approved the questions, we had to give our answers. And then those had to be submitted to Disney so that, you know, those could be vetted. And the company, uh, Joe Books, just didn't have the bandwidth to do that back and forth. So they were like, just don't do any interviews. So it really kind of, kind of crippled us from the outset. All we could really do was promote on Twitter. And that's not, you know, that's, that's fine if you've got a big enough following. And we have a decent following, but it just wasn't enough to kind of sustain the sales at the level that they expected them to. And and then, you know, they also wouldn't let us do things like variant covers to keep the book kind of fresh in in, uh, in customers' minds like or in, in, uh, in retailers' minds. I had a whole, like, plan of, like, a variant cover program that would have been, you know, not too not too harsh on the customer's pocketbook, but, we, you know, would have had, like, a, some nice little one in ten chases that, you know, kind of, like, you made you want to get the first 12 issues. And uh, so that we would be on a really solid footing. And they just didn't want to do any of that. They just didn't see the value in it. So I definitely understand what Sias, you know, what his feelings are when he's saying, like, you know, he wanted to do this and the company just didn't, doesn't feel like the company backed him up. I mean, but that's, that's the reality of it. You've got you've to hope you hit the ground. You get enough press at the beginning to hit the ground running and stay on people's pull, pull list long enough to create a buzz. Yeah, it's one of the crazy things, uh, not just the creators, but the, the customers need to realize as well. You know, DC Comics is not DC Comics. It's a little bitty entity within AT&T's enormous corporate structure. It is, it's not even a pimple on the ass of AT&T. Marvel Comics, yeah, sure, they make a lot of money off of Marvel characters at Marvel Studios, but as far as Marvel co Comics could go, you know, you're within this enormous corporate structure at Disney. You know, you, you can't just go out there and take chances and everything. It's got to be vetted, got to be approved, and there's a lot more red tape. And it, it, it kind of sucks. And that kind of goes into the last thing I wanted to talk about that Cy Spurrier talked about. He talked about a, a pitch that he was doing for Green Lantern. This was, was his story. It feels like something you could probably relate to. I actually had an effing magnificent black label pitch in with one of my favorite artists, which was all about separating the Green Lantern mythos from the current DCU continuity in a really cute, respectful way and telling a completely bonkers, psychedelic sci-fi story about memory, loss, and absolute power. We all loved it, editors included, but it was deemed too hard to sell. We live in the midst of a market conditions which sometimes seem tailor-made to F with storytellers like me who aren't very good at doing the obvious thing. You know, the, the interesting thing about that is that the pitch that he just gave, that's that little, that little blurb, made me interested in, see, in, in seeing that book. So I don't think that it's unmarketable. I think the problem with these companies, uh, and I think you see this at Marvel, I think that you see, you know, you'd see this uh, at DC, even though they've had like a big shakeup. Uh, they're probably a little bit different in, and I'll actually kind of delineate what I'm thinking here. With Marvel, I think that you have a lot of people who have risen to positions that are above their ability. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called the Peter, the Peter Principle. So, you know, you're good at job A, so we promote you to job B, and then you're not good at it, but we don't really demote you back to job A. We just leave you in job B. And so now you're doing job B incompetently. And I feel like that's what's happened at Marvel. Uh, they have a lot of people who've risen uh, to positions of power that don't know what they're, you know, don't know what they're doing and don't know how, don't respect their audience and don't know how to connect to customers. And these are all things that are very important. With DC, I feel like they had some experienced people in there that were good at their jobs. They fired all those people because they made too much money and they brought in younger people 
who are not as good at those jobs yet because they just haven't had the time to, you know, to, to kind of like build that resume and build that experience. So they're doing the, maybe, you know, maybe the best that they can, or maybe there's a lot of people there that are just, you know, terrified and, and just trying. And this is the problem when you create a corporate culture where everyone is afraid of losing their job is nobody takes any risks. Mm -hmm. And when you don't take any risks, you just get a bland kind of general malaise amongst your employees. And when you're in the creative field, you're going to get that from your books because no one wants to take a chance on anything. So size book sounds very interesting to me. It sounds like something that I would definitely check out, but they don't want to take a chance on it because it's too weird. It's too weird for the people in charge. They don't have the vision, the creative vision to kind of put you can't that see it as a movie. Yeah, I could definitely, I mean, I could definitely see it as a, well, that's probably even a harder, a harder pitch. That's what I'm saying. They can't see it as a movie. So why would we even invest time in it? Yeah. And, uh, and the funny thing is, is, I don't think that they're the ones that make the decisions of what makes it to the screen. Um, and, you know, Warner Brothers needs to really kind of get its act together with its, with its movies. I think we all kind of feel that way because they're all over the map. You've got ones that I genuinely really enjoy, like Shazam. And then you've got, you know, Man of Steel or Batman versus Superman, which yeah, I just, or, oh, or dear God, Justice League. Uh, so I think they, what they really need to do is they need a Kevin Feige who, you know, and there's so many talented people that they've had that have created universes for them in animation that, you know, I, I still think that uh, the DC, um, you know, from the, from the Batman animated series up through Justice League Unlimited is the best representation of the DC Universe characters that we've ever seen. And so you could bring in someone like Paul Dini to kind of oversee the creative of these films and get them back on track. You could bring in somebody like Greg Weissman, who's developed you know, numerous animated series and, and is killing it on, on Young Justice still, uh, which isn't getting the ratings I think that it deserves because it was on the DC app. But maybe that'll change now that uh, all of that content is moving to HBO Max. Maybe uh, it'll get a lot more eyes on it. But you've got these talented people and, and just because they're comics people they're not seen as people that can you know run the ship so they keep picking, hollywood yeah so they keep picking these hollywood people who don't care who don't have, have no connection to the characters who don't care about the property and who are just going to go in and change everything and you know maybe you get some you know occasionally you get something good out of that but uh but more more often you don't and i don't think that you know i think that jeff johns was a good person to have in that creative position but it doesn't seem like he's ever had enough influence over the directors and, and kind of the filmmakers to create a cohesive universe. Um, so I know that we kind of derailed into the movies here, but I, but yeah, I think that's all part and parcel of the way that DC is thinking and the way that it's trickling down and affecting uh, the comic book creators. Definitely. It feels like the DCEU, the successful movies that not, not, I'm not even talking about financially successful, like the ones that feel like they're quality representations of the characters are done in spite of all the challenges where it almost feels like the MCU stuff. Like they, there's, um, you know, they have a recipe there. They know, they know how to make the stuff work and DC is really playing catch up. But uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's same thing goes with in Hollywood. Who can do anything interesting or take a risk nowadays? You got Christopher Nolan and you got um, Quentin Tarantino. That's otherwise you got to go to Netflix. That's, that's actually, yeah, that's really true. Uh, you know, in Netflix, you're gonna get you're gonna get a fair amount of crap, but every now and then there's that that gem. I, I think that it's really a matter of we've hit a point where everything's reboot, re, uh, sequels, prequels. Everything's just in a cycle of reboot. I, you know, I I have a theory, <laughs> and everyone in the comments can tell me whether or not this is wrong. But I feel like we've hit a point where we're just regurgitating everything that came before. I think that maybe the eighties, like even if you think of like toy properties, the eighties was the last really like kind of creative bonanza we had, which is why they keep going back and trying to milk it and revive these properties. Uh, but you know, we just had everything coming out in the eighties, like every crazy thing you can imagine, you know, from masters of the universe, Thundercats, galaxy Rangers, power Lords, you know, just all these concepts that people were putting together, you know, with these really imaginative kind of things. And we kind of like lost that. And I, my theory is that as we move away from older creators, because you know I know a lot of uh, a lot of people who have worked in the animation industry and things like that. And once you hit a certain age, you're not fashionable anymore. And they start trying to pull like in these Cal Art students and things like that. But these this younger generation has been raised on a steady diet of these pop culture properties. Uh, they come in and they don't have any, they don't have any life experience of their own. So they're just kind of regurgitating and, and they're just regurgitating the things that they've seen. 
and you know trying to like put a new spin on it but the new spin isn't interesting it's like multiplicity I, the copy of the copy and everything is just keeps getting degraded yeah we've now hit the point where you know creators are standing there shaving their tongues and calling us steve <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> so uh yeah that's a multiplicity reference if no one uh, no one gets that but um and i think that it's because we we're dealing with a generation and this is just a theory of mine as a toy guy like i said everybody can tell me whether or not i'm right uh or wrong or uh, you know what have you we're this is like the video game generation they were raised on video games and so they had stories told to them as opposed to the previous generation which we didn't have video games we had action figures and we had to go out in the backyard and we had to dig holes and build things you know and play with the action figures and project our Im imaginations into them uh, and i feel like that's kind of affecting the new level of creatives if, if you didn't have that if you didn't have that formative experience of creating in your imagination and, and projecting it onto these things if you just were playing video games and the message was coming to you instead of you creating it, I think that's why we're hitting this point where everything just seems regurgitated because a lot of the younger, and, and that's not taking away from, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, really talented young people uh, that are in the industry that, you know, are trying to do good work. But if their bosses are these people who never played with, you know, never, never had any imagination, never played with action figures, and, and you run into it on the corporate level all the time, people who are in charge of making creative decisions that don't have a creative bone in their body you're not going to get good product and so and when you do it's going to be because somehow it escaped as opposed to it being designed there's definitely you know it's it's a new culture within comics it's something that you know customers and creators are going to have to get used to is there you know the the ability to take risk almost really isn't there anymore it's just going to be more batman stories more spider-man stories rehashing the same events over and over and over like we're seeing at the at marvel comics i'm sure it's going to trickle over even more to DC Comics, and uh, yeah, it's it's disappointing. But you know, si Simon Spurrier and, and yourself and the other creators are going to have to adapt to that environment, or essentially go find new work. I mean, I hate to be blunt about it. No, I, well, I think the adaptation is that, uh, and what you're seeing a lot of creators do, uh, you know, like Jason Fabok and, and Jeff Johns, uh, Scott Snyder, is you're seeing them move into doing their own stuff and selling it directly to the customer because the direct market. Uh, you know, from the corporate structure of the publishers all the way down to Diamond's distribution, the direct market is a dinosaur. And I, I you know, I hate to be negative because I love the comics industry. So, or, or, well, not so much the industry, but I love the comics medium so much that I hate to see it. I hate to see it go away. But the fact of the matter is it's going to change. And it feels right now to me like the current model for delivering comics to customers uh, that has been in place for, you know, decades it feels like a dinosaur that's all thrashing around in the tar and doesn't realize it's already dead. I think that everybody kind of needs to figure out what they're going to do, not count on these publishers to take care of them, not count on these publishers to back them up or even market them properly because the companies are filled with people who don't know what they're doing. And it's just kind of the, it's kind of in the, it feels like the industry is in its death throes and it doesn't feel like anybody's going to do anything. Certainly not at the big two, you know, is Marvel going to go in, you know, are we going to, are we going to hear that Disney went in and like cleaned house and, fired a bunch of people at Marvel and brought in people that were more dynamic. No. I mean, if they fire a bunch of people, they're going to bring in people that are cheaper, that are straight out of college. And, you know, much like it seems like DC has done. And I just, you know, I don't think that that's, I, I don't think it's an event that's survivable. So creators need to be branching out on their own and be building their own audiences. There'll be many who can't because they just can't seem to not treat the customer with contempt. But, you know, the ones that can are, will be really successful. I think you, you see people out there like, you know, for all the, uh, all the people that, uh, that that can't stand the guy and, and hate his guts, uh, Ethan Van Skyver has managed to connect with an audience. And, you know, you can debate how he's done that, you know, and the merits of it. But the fact of the matter is he's done it and he doesn't need DC Comics. He's making plenty of money. Doug Tenapel making plenty of money. Tim Lim, Mark Pellegrini, you know, making plenty of money. And it's just by connecting to an audience, cutting out those middlemen that will, will tell you no and getting your product out there. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I've talked to, uh, like I said, I know a lot of animators and things like that, people who've worked in the industry. And every one of them has a story of pitching an idea and having the whole table love it. And then it comes around to that one person who goes, well, I don't know. And they say, as soon as that happens, you will watch your support around the table evaporate. Because all of a sudden, when that one person says, nobody ever gets fired for saying no because you didn't spend any money. 
you know, you didn't cost the company any money. So you say no, and then you're, you're a hero because if the project fails, well, you're the guy that said no. So what happens in these corporate environments is one person says that they are unsure or that they don't know, and you'll watch it move through everybody else because everybody starts thinking, well, what if I'm the person who signed my name to this? And then it fails. And so they'll say no. So yeah, good creative ideas get killed all the time because of fear. That's crazy. Fear's, well, fear's the killer, man. In just in, in life and in business, you know, fear is absolutely the killer. Aaron, I do want to say thank you very much for joining me today. And some people might be going, hey, where was Comic Book Writing 101? That is every other weekend. So when we have one of those weekends, you'll you'll get an episode of that with with Mr. Sparrow and Mr. Pellegrini. But on the other weekends, Aaron has jo agreed to join me essentially at the same time. We're going to talk offline and we'll, you'll get one or two of these videos every week. So glad to have Aaron back on the channel. We, we've worked out our schedules and uh, love talking, you know, just comics and everything with you, brother. Yeah, I love it, man. Love being on. Uh, love the audience. Uh, everybody's, uh, everybody's fantastic. You know, this is fun stuff. I, I could do this all day. All right. Later, brother.